actually be unhealthy when you actually thought you were a healthy grandma. So let's first look at what emphysema is. So I'm going to use this, this whiteboard, you know, a piece of paper term, landscape wise. And over here, I'm going to draw sort of two cartoon like representations of alveoli sacs. So I'm going to come down here and draw this one kind of looking like this. And really trying to emphasize, and we'll do it like that. And then we'll do another one right here, kind of overemphasizing, but we kind of want to do it like this. And so this will be normal. And this will be emphysema. Big point is we have less surface area. So what this is supposed to be are alveolar sacs. And if you look at the total surface area you would have for diffusion, the normal lung compared to this lung over here with emphysema, there's a lot less surface area. That means you're going to have less opportunity for external respiration, the exchange of gases between the alveoli and the pulmonary capillaries. We know that normally in arterial blood, did anybody re, um, memorize yet the PO2, PCO2 values for arterial blood? Um, it's just PO2, 100. PO2, 100. Millimeter Good. Mercury. And what's the PCO2 value? 440. Awesome. Okay. So that's normal for us because of all that surface area we have for all good external respiration. What's interesting is when you look at the arterial gas values with a patient that has emphysema, they're, since they have less surface area, we're going to get less oxygen to go into the blood because there's less opportunity for diffusion. So it's not uncommon to have their PO2 values equal 50. And these are always millimeters of mercury, at least for us. Now, again, since there's less surface area, since we're gonna get less opportunity to get oxygen out of the air and into the pulmonary capillaries, can you see how we're gonna have less opportunity to get rid of CO2 and put it into the alveoli? Mm -hmm. So they're gonna have a higher than normal PCO2 value. Their PCO2, PCO2 value could be as much as 50 millimeters of mercury. So their arterial can be a PO2 of 50, and their arterial PCO2 can be 50. This gives them a rather interesting nickname. They're called 50-50s which is a nickname for some emphysema patients, because their arterial is 50 for the CO2 and the O2 is 50. Now we know that, what is the gas that we are mainly, that is mainly responsible for driving your normal respiration rates? Carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide, right? So if you were to look at an emphysema patient having higher than normal levels of CO2, should they be breathing slower or faster than a normal person? Faster. They should be breathing faster, but they're not. Mm. Now we gotta figure out why that's true. So over here, we're going to draw, and then again, sorry before you begin copying me here. I might need a little more space. So this is gonna be a capillary. And we have CO2 in our blood, so this would be blood. And we also have hydrogen ion in our blood. What is blood mainly comprised of? Oxygen and water. No, not oxygen. H2O. <laughs> okay. Mainly comprised of plasma, yeah. which is mainly comprised of water, right? So blood is mainly water. 
and that's where we can get some of these hydrogen ions from, from that CO2 plus O2 using carbonic acid equation, but also just hydrogen ions from other things that are happening metabolically in our body. Now, I want you to put a couple of these little things here, and any guesses as to what the, I'm trying to show? Those are the going to say? Yeah, just straight places. You're doing nice. Come on. <laughs> She's right. Simple scramble is at the theory. Why am I showing you that? How swear diffuses through. Where what diffuses through? The gases. CO2 and oxygen. Or oxygen. <coughs> well, you said three things. Oxygen and CO2. Is hydrogen going to diffuse out? No. No. Why not? Because it's charged. Because what? It's like a charge. It builds up in there. But why? why? Why won't hydrogen just diffuse out of the blood? How come this will diffuse out? Because that's just... But the hydrogen won't. That's an ion in the charge. It has a charge. Remember, charge yeah. things do not cross with the bilayers very easily. Five, and he's gonna do that. So he's what gonna we're do. looking at <laughs> is this is going to be our cerebral spinal fluid. Which means this is going to be where we have the medulla. Oblongata. So what we're going to do is we're going to draw over here a hydrogen ion sensor. And we'll put a little receptor over here. This is our hydrogen ion sensor. So is this a peripheral or chemoreceptor, central chemoreceptor? This is a central chemoreceptor. <clears throat> Remember how it mainly measures hydrogen ions. That's why it's called the hydrogen ion sensor. So medulla oblongata, central chemo, whoops, receptor. So as you just said, the hydrogen ions in our blood cannot diffuse out of the blood into the cerebral spinal fluid where I have my hydrogen ion sensor. So what is the hydrogen ion that they're sensing if it's not gonna be the hydrogen ions in my blood? The bicarbonate acid. True, but you have to figure out, remember, first of all, where is cerebral spinal fluid made from? The brain. What structure mm -hmm. in the brain? In the That's where, the the what structure in the ventricles makes cerebral spinal fluid? Coronary, 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 coronary. Nice, coronary plexus. <laughs> Very good. Now, coronary plexus is comprised of what? What two things make up the coronary plexus? Oh my gosh. Uh, the cells that begin with an E. Erythropoietin. Not erythropoietin, no, that's a no. hormone. Oh, Dependable no. cells. No. And no. what? Capillary. So we're going to draw a real crude little chorea plexus over here. We're going to do it sort of like this. This will be our capillary. And then lining it are going to be some dependable cells. We're just going to do it kind of like this. And we'll make these just some cuboidal like epithelial cells, they're called dependable cells, and we'll name them again in a second. This would be a this is blood. And since blood is mainly plasma. The plasma in the blood goes into an ependymal cell. And we'll do another one up here since it's easier to kind of show. So there's the plasma coming out. And out from there, since it's a different product, we'll change colors is cerebral spinal fluid. 
can simply just filter plasma. And that's the job of the impenetrable cells. They filter the plasma, and out comes cerebral spinal fluid. Now remember, these are lining the floor of the third ventricle, the roof of the third, and the fourth ventricle. And they're constantly just trickling cerebral spinal fluid from the capillaries that they are lining next to. So, cerebral spinal fluid is made from plasma. Plasma is mainly water. So what is cerebral spinal fluid mainly made up of? <coughs> plasma and water. Can't be plasma and water. water. Just water, water right? Now you have carbon dioxide diffusing into the cerebral spinal fluid of your medulla. Mm -hmm. What is that cerebral spinal fluid going to react with? The water and do your favorite equation. Wow. Right, so now we're going to have CO2 plus water to give you your carbonic acid. Oops, that's water. Wrong equation. And that breaks down into carbonic acid, bicarbonate, which then also gives off a hydrogen ion. That hydrogen ion is the one that is sensed by the hydrogen ion sensor, otherwise known as your central chemoreceptor. So if you have lots of CO2 in the capillaries to your medulla, the CO2 diffuses into the cerebral spinal fluid of the medulla, where you have a hydrogen ion sensor. The more CO2 in your cerebral spinal fluid, the more hydrogen ions you end up producing, the more hydrogens they detect. And what does that do to your respiration rates? Increase. It causes them to increase, right? Because you have that hydrogen ion graph in your respiration modes, where the higher the hydrogen ion, the increase in the ventilation rate you get. And that's how the central chemoreceptor realizes you have high levels of CO2. It's not actually measuring CO2. It's for the most part measuring the hydrogen ions that came because of the CO2 in your cerebral spinal fluid. This is what you and I are doing right now. This is not what an emphysema patient does, though. So first, let's make sure we're okay with this part so far. I'm confused, which is water, the CSF or the plasma? Plasma makes water, which makes CSF. Well, plasma and CSF both have as their major ingredient water. Okay. It's the common theme in, in both fluids. Okay. So does the plasma make the CSF, or is there like a chain? or? Well, and it, I mean, CSF came from the plasma. Okay. So as the plasma is filtering through the ependymal cells, they alter it a little bit and end up producing what we call cerebral spinal fluid. Okay, but the major component, component is water for each For, for each, yes. Okay. Was there another? I have a question. Yeah. Um, so is the increase of carbonic, bicarbonic acid going to increase or drop the pH level in the cerebral spinal fluid? Um, only a little teeny bit. That bicarbonate gets taken up by some other stuff. So these hydrogens are going to be going over here and then this bicarbonate ion hooks up with some other components and becomes inaccessible to the fluid. That's the easiest way to think about it. It just gets used up by something else. Because there are very few actual buffering abilities in cerebral spinal fluid. It's a very poor buffering fluid. But now let's go over to emphysema. The problem is you don't do a very good job at getting rid of the CO2 that's in your blood because right, you have a very poor surface area, very poor exchange location. So over time, the level of CO2 is going to increase. So let's, I guess we'll put it in, in purple. So now I'm going to get chronically elevated levels of CO2. That's going to give me chronically elevated levels of CO2 coming into my cerebral spinal fluid. What's that going to do to my level of hydrogen ions? It's going to make them chronically elevated over a long period of time. What does that do to the pH? It's going to drop it significantly. It goes. Does that lower your pH? Yes. Okay. Yes. You guys agree with that? Mm -hmm. All right. <coughs> Is that a good thing or a bad thing? It's a bad thing. Bad because it throws off enzymatic reactions. 
So your brain does not want a lower pH. It needs to now buffer against that. So this is what's going to give us what's called hypercapnia. And that is chronic elevated levels of CO2. Chronic elevated levels of CO2. That then gives you chronically elevated levels of hydrogen ions. That's not a good thing. So here's a brand new job that you did not know your tendril cells have. They sit there exposed to this fluid. They're exposed to that increase in hydrogen ions. And they say, okay, that's not good. We are going to produce something else besides cerebral spinal fluid. They are going to produce bicarbonate ions in an attempt to buffer the increase in hydrogen ions. So now these guys start producing bicarbonate ions. Now you've got something to actually absorb those excess hydrogen ions. This bicarbonate reacts with those hydrogens. And what do you get when you combine bicarbonate ion with the hydrogen? You get carbonic acid, right? Which could break down into water and CO2. So this then could lead to an increase and carbon dioxide, well, let's do it backwards. You guys can, you can see it. So this plus that would then give us H2CO3, and then that could form into CO2 plus H2O. That CO2 could then diffuse right back into your blood elevating your arterial or your blood values of CO2. Now, before you get to that question, right, let's go back to this. So the problem was high levels of CO2, producing high levels of hydrogen ions. That lowers my pH. Pentamol cells don't like that, so they start making a bicarbonate ion. The bicarbonate can then bind, just due to random chemistry, with the hydrogen ions that normally this hydrogen ion is trying to sense. If you remove that hydrogen ion, then what is this thing going to be sensing? Mm, hydrogen. Nothing. Because this hydrogen is now bound to that bicarbonate. Now, not every single hydrogen is going to be bound. But this is like a Geiger counter, right? The more hydrogens, the faster you breathe. If I start removing hydrogens, make the numbers less, what happens to my respiration rates? So this side of the room, I don't think, you guys know how to talk? What happens to the, if the number of hydrogens go up, what happens to your respiration rates? Go to increase. What happens if the number of hydrogen ions go down? Increase. Respiration rates go down, right? So here's the bicarbonate picking up those hydrogens. You're going to have a lower than normal, lower than expected respiration rates, given the fact that you have high CO2. You should be breathing faster, but you're not because the ependymal cells are making a bicarbonate ion. It's actually removing the hydrogen ions that the hydrogen ion is sensing. So you end up actually having chronically elevated levels of CO2 with normal or below normal respiration rates. And this is how people become what's called acclimated to elevated levels of CO2. They simply stop responding to the CO2 because they have been creating buffers to get rid of one of the byproducts of CO2 in cerebral spinal fluid, which is the production of those hydrogen ions. Question now. Okay, so is a This can't come from the blood because it's a charged ion. It can't cross the endothelium. But the carbon or the CO2 can come from the blood. Sure. 
because it, it's not polar. Yeah. It can diffuse right through cell membrane, like oxygen can. But can that CO2 be turned into that charged ion? Sure, right there. From the blood membrane. <laughs> I'm not sure I understand. So if there's bicarbonate in here, it's going to stay in there. If there's a hydrogen, it's going to stay in there. All right? So I'm not sure. I'm not sure what you're asking. I'm just pretty much wondering if you could transfer for the actual buffering, if you could transfer CO2 from the blood and use that to make the HCO3 minus, or is it only like carbon atoms and stuff produced in the epidermal cells actually used to make the HCO3 minus? Yes, the latter part. Okay. All right. This is going to be mainly coming from the epidermal cells. Oh, okay. So you're going to be the primary source of that. Do you guys okay with how? So I'm, I'm a little confused as how bicarbon, bicarbonic acid came from the epidermal cells. Well, they just make it. So we don't have to talk about how they're going to be making it. Okay. But so they, they have the ability of, of producing sort of like, you know, the pancreas produces bicarbon ions for digestion. Okay. So they have the ability to realize, okay, my neighboring environment's acidic. Mm -hmm. Therefore, through a, a bunch of intracellular signals, they start making carbonic or bicarbonate ions and in a sense actually they're, they're kind of doing this inside of them from the CO2 that's in here in a way. So epidermal cells make bicarbonic ions? They make carbonic, the, the bicarbonate ion yes and that bicarbonate binds with the hydrogen just randomly but there's a lot of this so there's a good chance it'll bind to some of this mm -hmm. and with fewer of these I get fewer Bye. signals to breathe. So I breathe slower than you would expect. Because you know I have lots of this because I have lots of that. And if I have high CO2, I should be breathing fast. And, and we're not. How come the bicarbonate ions from the equation doesn't take care of the hydrogen ion? Like why does it get, why does the pH lower if you're Because this bicarbonate gets picked up with some other ions that are in the spinal fluid. And so it gets sort of distracted. It gets uh, kind of removed from the equation. Okay. So stoichiometrically, we start getting increases in these, and these are being used for something else. Okay. So that's why we need another source of bicarbonate to bind up with those large numbers of hydrogen ions. What causes the decrease in CO2 in the Well, one is exposure to toxic gases, which is my most favorite one. My least favorite one, because they need to quit sort of doing it this way, is they say, exposure to marijuana. It's really just an anti-pot campaign. It's smoke, any particulate. If it's cigars, cigarettes, pot, I don't care if you smoke leaves from your pine tree. That's going to give you a particulate that damages the simple squamous epithelia, and they begin to collapse. And so when you actually just simply just remove that wall, that's where you get that larger volume but less surface area. The squamous cells are just dying because the macrophages that are lined up alongside of them can't kill the toxins from the particulates. So it damages the elasticity or does it just No, it literally damages the simple squamous epithelia. Okay. It actually damages the literal wall of the alveolar sacs. So it'd be like me sort of starting to take a, a big hammer and punch holes in that wall. It is literal physical damage to the cells. All right, so now comes part two of this. So you're now an emphysema patient, and you go to the clinic, and they say, well, your PO2 is rather low, and your PCO2 is rather high. We need to raise your O2 levels and drop your CO2 level. So you and I, when we're not in hypercapnia conditions, are mainly regulating our breathing by the central chemoreceptor. Grandma, though, or a person who has hypercapnia, or maybe another way to think about it would be COPD, for chronic obstructive pulmonary disorder, you're not using your central chemoreceptor as the primary driver of your breathing. You're using the peripheral chemoreceptor. And this is why I had you guys 
print out this little slide in that one slide PowerPoint mode. If I can figure out what button I want to push here. Thank Bless you. you. Thank you. So let's look at this. This is how the peripheral chemoreceptor works. And we're going to look at it and understand how it responds to oxygen, and then pretend there's less oxygen to see how this works. So up here we have a capillary. Whoops, I get my pointer to work here. So there's a capillary, right? This is then going to be a peripheral chemoreceptor in the aorta or in the carotid. So look what the diagram is telling you. You've got low PO2 coming from the blood, going into that the peripheral chemoreceptor. What does that low O2 cause to happen? What does that do to that potassium channel? Closes, all right? Now here's one thing that's a little bit different. You guys are usually used to a chemical signal from the outside of the cell mm -hmm. making the cell do something. Mm -hmm. This is a chemical signal from within the cell causing this chemical gated potassium channel to close. Now for most of this, yes, you already know how to do this. If you close a potassium channel, what is the consequence of closing the potassium channel? It Okay, so potassium won't leave, right? Taking its positive charge with it. So the inside of the cell becomes more positive, right? So you're now depolarizing the cell. What does that do to voltage-gated calcium channels? It opens them, and who comes into the cell? Calcium, and what does calcium do? It binds to a vesicle to do exocytosis. And this is how the peripheral chemoreceptor says, hey, get off your butt and start breathing more. When you have low levels of O2, these channels start to close. So think of it as sort of like, here I've got three potassium channels, and they want to be open. I'm an oxygen molecule. I associate with one of them, they close. That means less potassium is leaving. The cell becomes a certain level of positiveness. So we're going to get some voltage-gated channels to be open, but not all of them. But if we get more and more potassium channels to close, the cell becomes more and more positive, stronger depolarization, more voltage-gated calcium channels open, more calcium coming in, more exocytosis, we breathe faster. Does that all work? Everybody okay with that? Isaiah, yeah. you okay? Right now, let's kill grandma. Well, not intentionally. So I see grandma, I'm visiting her, she looks a little pale, a little, little bluish, maybe, maybe I know about cyanosis, and I think grandma doesn't have enough oxygen coming to her through her oxygen mask. So I'm hungry, I've been visiting with her all day long, she's kind of dozing, I'm gonna go to lunch. So I simply try and be the nice little loving nephew, figure, well, she needs a little more oxygen. I'm gonna give her a little more O2, maybe, you know, five liters a minute, and then I'm gonna go to lunch. I say hi to the nurse, going to lunch, Come back five hours later, there's a code blue in grandma's room. Why? You ate a lot of food. Huh? You were on a long lunch break. Well, you know, had some friends to visit. <laughs> Look what happens, right? If you have lots of O2, now just to reverse the path. Lots of O2 keeps these channels open, right? Potassium leaves, causing the cell to become very mm -hmm. negative, not opening voltage-gated channels, so calcium's not coming in. You're not releasing neurotransmitters to tell you to breathe. All the peripheral chemoreceptor knows is that apparently there's lots of O2 in here. Somehow John or Grandma's getting lots of oxygen. She must not be needing to breathe that fast, so we can slow down her breathing. And the more O2 you give her, the slower her breathing becomes. They probably won't kill her right out, but you'll put her in a very bad position, physiologically. And this is the quandary you get into the medical world. Here's a patient who's not getting, they're almost getting half the amount of oxygen due to the damage of their lungs. So you as a clinician in the medical world want to give them more O2. But you realize the problem. 
The more O2 I give her, the more her peripheral chemoreceptors think she's doing a good job on her own, and it'll slow down her breathing. So it's a damned if you do, damned if you don't. So there's a fine line between how much you can give. So there's a standard order. Emphysema patient with no medical history, you give no more than two liters of oxygen a minute. It'll make them better off without putting them in, in a very dangerous situation. So you know the extent of their emphysema, and you get your measures of blood gases with an oximeter and see exactly what their values are. And you don't want to give them any more than that until you have physician's orders. Otherwise, you'll end up putting grandma in a very bad place. And this is the risk that emphysema patients have. My uncle, before he passed away, um, had severe, severe emphysema. I, if I remember right, I, I, was, I wasn't in biology at the time, but I think I remember hearing my dad talk about how his PO2 values were at 35. Now, my uncle was a bottom turret gunner in World War II in B-17s, and he learned, just learned, <laughs> learned to smoke three packs a day of camels due to what he did. I understand the stress. I mean, you've got planes flying at you, shooting at you and such. And he got so damaged from, lung, from smoking for decades that he was walking around with two pumps. One was to suck the fluid out of his lungs with, and the other was to give him some oxygen so that he wouldn't pass out, but not so much that he would stop breathing. And he finally, one day, said enough of this. And he, he ended it um, with his doctor's permission. Um, but that's the problem that the human patients have, is we're not getting enough, but if you give me too much, I will stop breathing. So remember their nicknames are 50-50s, right? Why they're called 50-50s now. And you guys have any questions? I'll never ask you, I won't ask you to reproduce this on the exam, but the questions about it, yeah. Like, what is the source of bicarbonate ions that are buffering or buffeting the hydrogen ions, right? They're coming from the ependymal cell. You know, what is the definition of hypercapnia? What causes it? Um, for an emphysema patient, who's the primary chemoreceptor that drives their normal breathing? Is it the central? Is it the peripheral? What happens if you give them increased oxygen? You know, why does it do that kind of stuff? And these are the things you'll learn all about in nursing programs or PA schools. And now you know not to give grandma lots of oxygen. Give her a little bit. Or don't go on a long lunch break. Well, that's okay. She's taking a nap anyways. Because she sleeps so long. All right, no questions? All right. You guys are done.